Well, hello everybody. My name is Sylvain Rochon. It's been a week or two. I just wrote another article, um, which I'm pretty excited about because it pertains to a lot of the discussion that's going on in the U.S. Uh, elsewhere in the world, including in, in Britain and in many countries in the um, European Union as well. Um, it's the idea of capitalism being evil and socialism also being evil. And I thought maybe some definitions, some history, and some descriptions of why this discussion is actually going on. Why are both camps promoting their own economic system in a very weird way that creates lots of confusion? Of course, there's a lot of misinformation ignorance uh, around it so I thought I'd give it a shot that's my <laughs> that's my take at kind of thinking ahead because there's actually some really positive takes we can pull out of it is just inundated by lots of angry rhetoric right now and uh, uh, and just bad information it's very confusing for a lot of people so um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about both uh, first off, the U.S. is usually considered the epitome of capitalism, and uh, it's very closely uh, almost pure uh, capitalist, uh, which which means free market. Everything is 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 uh, all prices and transfer of goods, distribution, how people come end up in society as far as wealth is all considered by a free system that is not controlled. That's Complete capitalism. Of course, the US, U.S. is not completely capitalist. There, there are some social systems, like a social security net. There is some public education um, uh, and, and some other programs, uh, like for old age and so on and so forth. And the, which is typically, if you look at the uh, at the discussions that's going on, uh, there's a lot of people in the states that want to go complete capitalism, and they don't like the government to be involved in anything to create any kind of quality. You're just supposed to pull yourself by your bootstraps and get going and you'll, you'll make, um, make your life. And if you can't, well, too bad for you, which is very inhumane, honestly, because some people just don't have the capacity. Some people get uh, sick for a long time or are waiting for a surgery. They can't work. And there's all these issues, um, you know, genetically, maybe genetic problems, pre-existing conditions. We hear a lot of uh, that, that words. Uh, uh, surrounding Obamacare uh, and Medicaid, the you know the, effort, the Affordable Care Act, which is another word for uh, Obamacare, and uh, but there's all these conditions that we know make sense that are not the fault of the individuals. Individuals just can't compete in the free market to survive. So there's this this kind of discussion about how do we provide for them, and the uh, a lot of democratic candidates or, or and also socialists that may not be democratic are saying well we need to take care of these people and they use the word socialist which enrages <laughs> a bunch of other people because there's emotional tenure to this pertaining to you know this the uh, the union of social uh, soviet socialist republics I have trouble with the ussr essentially and also communist china which is extremely socialist uh, and, and is becoming less so. But I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and so it, it kind of conjures up these demons and these evils in the world. Like the word socialist is terrible. Um, I mean, here, here's a chart. I'm just putting, going, going to put it up here. Um, actually, if you look at it, capitalism has a lot going for it. It has lots of positives. It drives economies, innovation, motivation. Competition is actually great for keeping costs down, which is good for the consumer. Lots moving towards it. That's why the U.S., especially in the, uh, between the 60s and the 80s, was so strong. It was very strong capitalism. Uh, people were going great. There were some social programs as well, of course, back then, but uh, a powerhouse. And a lot of countries decided, well, look at the U.S. They're doing great. Let's use some of that capitalism in our own economies, and a lot of countries uh, did better afterwards, uh, copying some of the American successes. And 
And in parallel, a lot of Europe had uh, some socialist uh, elements already, and they adopted some of the capitalistic um, elements. And they, they, they were, for a long time, they were mixed. And right now, some of the European countries, especially Scandinavia, have kind of figured out a really nice secret sauce that combines capitalist-driven economies with a strong socialist backbone. And, and a lot of Americans, I hear, they're, they're kind of saying, well, that's great, but capitalism, yay, it's better. And, and whenever there's an opportunity, whenever there's a country that is overly, or overtly socialist, uh, even though they're, they have strong capitalistic tendencies, like Venezuela, uh, and, it, and things go bad, a lot of people say, ha-ha, that's, that's why socialism fails. Uh, it's more complicated than that, just because one country has fairly strong socialist um, parts into it, into its economy, and fails, doesn't mean that socialism as a system is a failure. However, if you look at the other part of the, uh, of the chart, uh, socialism sounds good on paper. That's why Karl Marx in the uh, 1917, I believe, uh, he wrote about it, he thought it was a great idea because he was, he was able to foresee as a sociologist and economist that capitalism as a concept had a, 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 a serious failure of creating inequality of wealth between the more capable and richer and the less capable or, or, or sick. And there would be that gap, which we have observed. And it is a serious problem. He, but he saw this as a potential failure of an economy. So he was proposing a, uh, some kind of a communal cooperative society and economy where things were all spread out and everybody would be able to eat. And, and uh, on paper, it looked great. But um, uh, after uh, a few years after the, um, you know, Karl Marx wrote uh, his books and, and had discussions around it, and he wasn't very popular uh, when he wrote, but um, there was a big worker and military uh, soldier revolt to revolution in Russia. Uh, they uh, threw out the czar, so it was a monarchy back then, and they said, no, they're treating us badly, the workers have to take care of themselves, and they saw the books by Karl Marx as a, something new that didn't exist that seemed on paper to be great for them. So it was adopted as a system, a socialist, also communism as a government form surrounding it. China did the same thing back then, a little bit later. It's like, well, this is, you know, Russia is doing great. It's, they're, they're, they're elevated. The, and, and they had problems with the rulership there as well. The workers and the, mili and the soldiers decided they wanted to take care of their own people, of, of themselves, of the society as a whole, hence socialist, right? Um, and, uh, and, and they overthrew. There was a revolution there. Uh, it went more military in that, in that case. But uh, ultimately, well, actually, they were both military, uh, but ultimately, they created the Socialist Republic of China, and, uh, and they thought it was a great idea. Now, in practice, over a number of years, um, that created a lot of tensions, in, in the, even the Cold War, because on one hand, they have this, these socialist revolutionaries that just came out of that revolution, and they hated capitalism because they... They thought that was equal to the monarchy, you know, the, the rich at the top and the, um, and, and the poor at the bottom and equality. They thought, thought that was a great, uh, the, the terrible idea. We're we better because we have a socialist system. And the capitalists saw, saw the socialists and how they were kind of becoming, uh, <laughs> they were becoming a problem, let's say. And, and so socialist capitalism bad and all that stuff. So it created this, this division between the two systems that are quite opposite to each other. Uh, but politically, it was, it was a, a big problem. Now, in practice, if you look at those two socialist countries, um, as far as progress, didn't work out very well because what Marx couldn't anticipate, I suppose, was the motivation from the people just wasn't there. But over the years in Russia and China, we could see how that could create a failure of economy. And we know this. Um, and hence, both Russia and China and other countries that attempted this, that are less known, they adopted some aspects of capitalism. 
uh, because that worked for to run with the economy. It also worked well with almost every other country in the world that were that had a capitalistic type of uh, type of economy, capitalist type of economy. So, so it, they, they started off being very, very socialist early in the 20th century, became more and more capitalist over time, still are pretty much capital, uh, pretty much socialist. And at the same time in Europe and, and in the US, uh, more and more socialist programs were added to take care of the people that people felt, well, they can't compete because they just can't. Disease, uh, out of work, accidents, um, uh, whatever, right? Uh, and then there's this social struggle inside the country, in particular in the U.S. here, uh, about uh, which is better. Well, honestly, guys, both are good. The, the the countries that are having the best success, that are creating the most most rich people, that are uh, per capita, of course, everything is per capita, that are um, where where people are most happy. Uh, where the people are most educated, uh, the cost of doing business is lower, and so on, among the, the, the richest countries, so the OECD countries. Uh, it's the Scandinavians, it's, uh, it's Canada, it's, um, it's, it's, it's Mexico even, uh, although that's for a different reason why they are uh, the, no, it's, it's actually it's not Mexico. They're, Mexico is only for the cost of doing business. Everything else is, is not so good. But, uh, but you have some other countries like the UK, for example, they have uh, you know, great uh, social systems and a balance with a very strong capital system. And how, how it works and why it's, these seem to work better to create, uh, to alleviate some of the poverty and to, uh, to also have lots of uh, opportunity for the individuals to become to, from rags to riches. riches it is because of the there's a proper or more a better balance between socialist systems and capitalism and the the way i kind of describe it uh, i try to describe it in a simple way if you if you cannot function with the, if you don't have the basics met education healthcare security shelter just food and water, like the basic stuff. If you don't have that or you can't have that, you don't have that springboard, it's really hard to do any kind of competition against people that have those things. So you have like a really hard time doing anything. And so bottom line, particularly in the States, if you're in the bottom 20% of the economy as far as income or opportunity, it's way less likely that you're going you're to go and, and change from that, from that strata to another strata compared to, uh, to countries like in Scandinavia where it's way more likely. They have more rich people per capita and so on. Just because there's less of a springboard, it's harder to get the basics done. Once you have that, though, it, poverty line stuff, you don't need to have much. It's not a handoff. Just get, make sure I'm fed. Make sure I have access to shelter. Make sure I have you know the basic stuff. Then you're motivated, and you can go and participate in the capitalist economy and, and, and run with it because your body's fed, your brain is 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 healthy, your body's healthy as well. Now you can compete with everybody else. So that's that's why a mix of both types of systems works well. Very little socialism is needed you just need a, a government or, or some kind of central entity that takes care of the people just give them whatever whatever they need and then you can go capitalistic capitalist all the way uh through for the rest uh not a problem competition is awesome cost down quality high and, and uh, of course you have to like one of the problems with capitalism is the um is uh, monopolies can emerge, so you have to have checks and balances for that, which uh, we are kind of weak on right now. Uh, and a lot of big companies are getting too big. Uh, it's not only a, uh, an idea; it's actually hurtful for capitalist uh, systems if the uh, companies just get too big in their industries, because that you don't have competition as much, and then prices go up, and that that's bad for consumers, and it it gets terrible for everybody. Now, right now we have the opportunity to create a really good system because one of the complaints of the capitalists is that social systems are expensive. 
And also, government is woefully inefficient. That's entirely true. So you can have the unbiased effect of this social system to provide the, the springboard for everybody, but it's horribly inefficient and it's costly if it's badly managed. But we have blockchain technology, we have artificial intelligence, we can build a system that costs very little, that is completely automated, completely unbiased, nobody's really running it. It's just on, with it, of its own mind by design, and it provides basic needs and basic goods and services and, and a basic income basic uh, for anybody. So people have a choice to buy food instead of, you know, like old Russia, waiting line for your share of food. Uh, that doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. Give, them, give people money and then you can have access to the free market with cheap goods, fruits and vegetables and whatever you need. And you buy what you need from, but, but you have the money available to actually cover your own needs for yourself, by yourself. So, um, so that's what we can build. We have the opportunity now to actually do that. We can do it intelligently. And then you can go all capitalist, uh, all the way you want. It's fine. People with that only, only, all we need is a, an opportunity to, to have, have a healthy start, a good, a decent education, you can buy a better education, but yet you need a decent one. You can buy better healthcare, but you need the basic needs met. You need to, to actually be healthy, to be functional in the economy. Uh, you know, poverty and ignorance, but like low education and a bad health is super costly to an economy, way more. Basic income can pay for itself if it covers the poverty line. The, 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 the return on that is huge. Just the numbers in Canada, basic income in Canada would cost about, I, think, I believe the number is $76 billion a year. It's a low population, I know, 38 million people, but that, that's the, the cost, it would, uh, it, it, what it would cost to taxpayer, if you will. And, and you figure, well, okay, it replaces some of the, so, uh, the safety net that's already there, that costs $33 billion. So really the basic income costs $43 billion a year, still really expensive for the population that's up there. And then since you're, you're removing the poverty line, like there are no more pre poor people. Everybody has what they need. They can buy themselves with their purchasing power, buy what they need. Then, like because that poverty's not there, well, you're saving, we know from basic income experiments that we would save about $19 billion a year in healthcare costs alone. Well, that's, that's almost half of that $43 billion. And then uh, we know for a fact that 80% of the people in the justice system, anywhere in the justice system being processed, um, are below the poverty line because they don't have their, their, their they can't make ends meet. So they, they do things they shouldn't be doing to make ends meet, to, to feel safe or to have security or whatnot. And they're just not mentally, uh, mentally healthy either because it, maybe they don't get, get access to that, which causes a lot of people being on the street, in fact. So if you, if you remove the poverty line, that's a huge amounts of cost that is saved in the justice system. And uh, the estimate is you would save another between 20 and $40 billion a year just in lawyers and judges and processing incarceration costs and all the shebang that so, so basically basic income by removing poverty pays for itself annually and more and that's the same situation in the states basically you could fund a basic income using like the carbon tax and dividend like what we're, we're doing uh, in Canada next year, I believe. We could help funding it by a land, land value tax or other mechanisms to kind of support it. But basically, just a removing poverty by itself is a great thing, but also it saves huge amounts of money. And on top of that, we could automate all this redistribution of, uh, of, of wealth, the basic income by blockchain and artificial intelligence making these programs super efficient to administer. And, and it pays for itself just by removing poverty. So, I mean, who wouldn't want that? 
We need to think along those lines and engineer these systems. We can do it right now. And the next few years, we'll just have more AI, more intelligent blockchain, uh, and more great, great technologies we can use to actually create these, these programs for everybody. And we can mix socialism as a base and then capitalism as a massive, top heavy uh, uh, process that allows innovation and, uh, and success and, uh, and to separate the, uh, you know, the, the sheep from the wolves, if you will, all this stuff that, that works. Uh, we can still do that, all of that. And we have eliminated poverty and we have great healthy individuals that are going to school more, that are, that are generally more healthy. So walk around being productive in society, doing all sorts of stuff that they want to do and chasing dreams, the American dream and all this beautiful thinking. We can do it. The question is, which country is, is it going to be the States that's going to be the first to actually decide, okay, let's do this. Is it going to be Canada? Is it going to be Estonia with all this? their super high tech government. Everything is electronic now, including voting and everything that should be electronic and secure in the States. Uh, who's going to be? Well, you talk to your, uh, your politician and discuss this. It's time. Ciao for now. <laughs>